Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. The Oklahoma Land Access Program, or OLAP for short, is a great example of a non-traditional way that the Wildlife Department is pursuing additional hunting and fishing access right here in Oklahoma. Special biologists work to find cooperating landowners who will lease their land to us so that we in turn can make them accessible to licensed hunters and anglers. It provides landowners with an additional source of income and also provides sportsmen and women with more options for public hunting and fishing, making it really a win-win for everybody. So keep your eye out for more OLAP signs popping up all across the state as more landowners jump on board. Just another reason to love Oklahoma and the adventures that await you. So right now we're measuring, see how long the pry are. We have a chart that shows that at a, certain, at a given length, there's so many pry per pound. So we're trying to figure out what size they are right now so we get a good count and we start harvesting the basin to stock out into their grow out ponds. We want to put in roughly 80,000 per acre in our grow out ponds. So if we can get a good estimate on how many there is per pound, then we just know how many pounds we need to put put into each pond. So those are averaging a half an inch, which our chart shows that there's a 8,000 per pound, but we need 10 pounds to get 80,000. Y'all ready? I'm ready. Each time they get a get a bucket in here, we add add to the list on the chart we've made. It keeps track of of uh, how many pounds we've got so far and and total number. Uh, right now we're at 61,600 fish, 7.7 .7 pounds. We still need to get another 1,800 and or 18,400. We'll have to wait and bring the rest of the pond in and. See if we can fill it with that. Uh, these will all go out into our grow ponds. Uh, there's 80,000 per acre. Uh, they'll stay in for approximately two, two and a half weeks, get up to an inch and a half, and, uh, and then get harvested and taken to the lakes.
So we have stocked fingerlings uh, at Grand Lake in the past, but because they're farther north, cooler climate, we didn't see uh, success of, of those fingerling stockings. So by stocking these adult fish, um, we know that they'll have a much better chance of survival. And then once these fish uh, spawn in Grand Lake, we're gonna have the ability to uh, produce uh, F1 hybrids which are more cold tolerant than the pure Florida bass, which is what these fish are. And the idea there is that their, their offspring have a better chance of survival, but also still maintain that great growth potential that we see from the Florida genetics. So this is kind of a in-lake F1 stocking program by putting these fish up at Grand. Get on. Probably best one. That's so We just finished up fry harvest for the year. We'll wait two weeks, three weeks, and do fingerling harvest. <laughs> uh, we're headed out to Grand Lake to stock some uh, brooders. Hopefully, they'll spawn with the northern bass and make an F1. So, we'll see. And so uh, if, you, if you're a bass angler out there right now and you're targeting bass and going after, you know, bass on spawning beds and trying to catch a big one, just remember that if it's a trophy to you, that's all that matters. It's a trophy in your eyes. Well, it's been a while since our last catfishing episode, and I know there's a lot of you out there who really enjoy bank fishing for catfish just as much as I do, so we're gonna give it another try today. In our first episode, we focused on points that jut out into lakes. That's one of my favorite spots to fish, especially if there's been a, a headwind or a, a flanking headwind blowing into that point, sometimes very productive for catfish and lakes. The next episode, we just fished an old mud flat. Many of our lakes here in Oklahoma have, especially on the upper end of the lakes, mud flats with basically no topography, no structure to speak of, no variation in depth, all the things you normally look for in a good catfishing spot. But those mud flats get really, really productive, especially in the springtime, particularly when the shad start spawning and you can really fill up a stringer sometimes. But we're gonna switch gears today a little bit and employ one of my favorite tactics for bank fishing for catfish, and that's fishing in running water after a flooding rain, which is what we've had here in the Texoma region. We've had a exceptionally dry spring. Today's the last day of April, but a couple of days ago, we finally got that big rain, over four inches in most of the basin of Texoma. And as you can see behind me here, the water's running. There's many creeks that run into Texoma. This is one in particular that's just starting to widen out into the lake, which is a place I really like to target when it's running. Still a lot of foam and debris coming down. There's a lot of rough fish in here, carp, buffalo, gar, drum. Hopefully we can wade through them and, and catch a couple of catfish because catfish love to nose up into fresh, muddy water. Now that's probably an oxymoron, but you know what I mean. When the flooding water comes down these creeks, it brings all types of nutrients and bait, all types of dead material washing down, and they basically go on a feeding frenzy. And hopefully we'll have some up in here looking to eat today. Now what I'm gonna use today and these are basically six foot Walmart specials. And I have old Ambassador 5000s on each of them. I bought them used off of eBay. And anyone in the know on catfishing reels knows that an old Ambassador 5000, especially the old Swedish models, are fantastic. One, maybe one of the best, if not the best overall catfishing reel. If you take even decent care of them, they can last you years and perhaps even decades. I've got them spooled up with Berkley Trilene Big Game 30 pound test line, so we can hold anything if we happen to get a hold of a big one today. And basically, my setup is, is real simple, same as always. I got a four ounce bank sinker on the bottom. Up above that, about a foot and a half. I'll tie a, a leader into my line, probably 10 inches, and then have a Eagle Claw wide bend laser sharp number four hook on that. Also, always bring my favorite rod with me. It'll hopefully see some action at some point today. It's just a, a real limber, medium action, again, Walmart six foot rod that I've got an old Shimano Calcutta with 20 pound Berkeley big game line on. 
because you know I get a fish on that and it kind of harkens back to the cane pole days with all of the, the flexibility so I always enjoy catching fish on that as well. Bait for today now in running water almost any bait will work because they're out here looking for anything they can get a hold of to eat. Worms, crawdads, cut perch, chicken liver, shad, you name it. But my go-to bait is always fresh shad and I was fortunate enough to catch some big gizzard shads a few days ago in my cast net. Now I'll mention something about shad too. The little shad don't last very long, a day or two, and they start getting soft and they won't stay on your hook very well. But I want you to know those big gizzard shad, if you'll take care of them, keep them relatively dry and packed in ice, they're good to go for a week and even more. In fact, these shad I have today, I've got cut up into chunks, but they're five days old, so we'll see how they work out. I also have some earthworms. Of course, that's a fantastic bait in running water. The earthworms I have, I actually grow myself. I had an old boy that was throwing away a chest-type freezer. It was inoperable, and so he gave it to me for free. I bought a 50-pound bag of what's called spangled peat moss from Walmart. I saturated that peat moss set it in the bottom of that chest freezer, probably about a foot deep, put my earthworms in there. They're called Georgia Browns. They're not as long as a night crawler, but they're real fishy worms. They'll definitely catch catfish if there's any around. And I feed them about once a week with chicken crumbles. It's basically chicken feet. You can get a 50 pound bag at a feed store for seven, eight dollars. And if you think about it, you can hardly buy two containers of night crawlers at the bait shop for, for that much money. So it's pretty economical. And I keep that chest freezer on the north side of my shop building so it doesn't get that direct hot sunlight during the summer. And they, they'll keep all year round and they'll reproduce in there. So you'll always have bait available when it's time to go fishing. And lastly, I've got some grub worms. Just white grubs, beetle grubs. I don't use them very often because I don't find them, quite frankly, very often. But funny story, a couple of days ago, we was having one of those big deluges of rain. And I looked outside, I have a dog, it's a shepherd mix named Shep, real original I know, but he was a rescue dog. And I saw him eating stuff off of the ground, running here and there. I didn't have any idea what he was doing. So I went out there to take a look and those grub worms were coming up out of that wet ground to get out of the, the water. And he was picking them off one by one and swallowing them down kind of like a great blue heron swallowing a perch or something. I didn't know dogs would eat grub worms, but this one will. Maybe he's watched too many episodes of Naked and Afraid, I'm not sure, but I was able to get ahead of him and get me about a dozen, so we'll put grub worm on one of these poles and see if it'll produce. Grub worm was always one of my dad's favorite fishing baits, and my dad and I, this time of year in April, would always take a week, I would take off work. We would fish all week, every day, bank fishing for catfish. We did that for decades and he passed away uh, last day of November in 2020 died of COVID-19 actually and so I'm gonna dedicate this day to him because I know he would love to be here today now he lived a, a, a long life he was just two weeks shy of 95 years old healthy the whole time uh, World War II Battle of the Bulge Vet so he had a full life and he's gone on to his reward so that's a good thing but uh, we'll dedicate this day to him but enough talking, we're gonna get these baited out and tossed in and see if we can get a rod to bend. We'll, uh, we'll put a piece of cut shad on this first one here. And I've cut these shad up. They come off of a, a big shad. I just fillet them off of the shad and then cut them into, oh, probably two inch strips that are probably a half inch wide. Now the thing to remember is you want to have plenty of your hook exposed after you put this chunk of shad on there. So just come down probably an eighth to a quarter of an inch below the top of the cut bait. Bring it through. Make sure any scales that were on the barb or the tip of the hook are removed so you have that sharp hook and your barb available. And that's the good thing about these wide bend hooks. You have plenty of, of hook remaining because that's a big bait and you don't want to get the bait over the point of your hook or you'll lose the hook set every time. Put that one right out by that floating debris out there. That's always a little bit of structure. Even in running water, I like to target it. We're gonna put a grub worm on this hook. It's one of those big white grubs I was talking to you about earlier. 
Now, one thing I will do with these, they've got a natural bend in them, and if you bring the hook through that natural bend, sometimes that worm will be in the way of your point. So what I'll do is come behind the head there, the opposite direction of the bend, cast that out and see if something's interested in a grub today. Put some earthworms on this one. Tell you what, I take those all day long, twice on Sunday. Really nice eating size channel cats. Doesn't have to be worms. I think I'm gonna string him up. I don't know what the bite force is on these channel cat, but it's up there. <laughs> well, we've already got enough for supper. It's just bonus from here on out. that one up that's just a, a fantastic blue cat love fishing this running water yeah he's gonna clear 12 it's always from the tip of the snout to the end of one of the forks in the tail 30 and one quarter so we've got our 30 inch fish for the day 12 and 12 12 and a half pounds that's what it's all about We'll dedicate that one to my dad, Marvin Banner, right there. He would, he'd have a smile a mile long to catch fish like that. I enjoy all types of fishing, I really do. Anything that's biting, I like to be there attempting to catch it, but there is something special about catfishing to me. You know, when you can set your poles out on a beautiful day like today, sit back and relax, and you know, watch you getting a bite right now, and let the fish come to you. I like that more passive type of fishing. It's, to me, it's more relaxing, and I think that's why I give it the edge over other types of, of fishing from the bank. He's in there, but that boy is 40 feet back in there. Is it big enough to swim up in? No, it's big. He's probably a big fish. Oh, here, watch out. I have a question for you, Leslie. Why did you want to hand fish? Well, when I first got asked, I didn't. I mean, I'd always heard a lot of stories that, horror stories mainly about this, and I started thinking about it though, and all the stories that I'd heard were um, hand-me-downs and people who had heard it from other people who had heard it from other people, so nobody really knew for sure, couldn't give me their own experience, so I figured you couldn't knock it until you tried it, so I thought I'd come out here and well, there's always seem to be a lot of horror stories associated with noodling, and actually, if you use a little bit of common sense and careful in what you're doing, it is a safe sport, but it's not something that most people want to initiate on their own. You know, they don't want to go out and go in water five or six or seven foot deep and start feeling under rocks or under clay banks and stuff with their hands. He's, I don't know where he's at. He's under something over there. You got him plugged up over there? Plugged here, do Huh, I know he's in there. I, I'm, I just know. Is it a bit? Make, it's open right here, Billy. Get right in there. I got the bottom closed off. Go out that way. I got it right here. Make sure there ain't no other holes right here. Okay. There ain't no other holes before Billy's at. Okay, now be, be easy. I'm going to go in there and feel of him and see what he feels like. Huh? Yeah. Are y'all in there? Best I can get in there. Yep. Right, okay, here. easy now. Big old crazy. That boy is a hog. Make sure that hose plugged up. Is he a hog? He's a big fish. Ooh. This is a big fish. Here, 
I don't, I don't know if you want to hold this and I'll let you play with him. Here, the stringers in my back. How big you think he is? Right in here is where he's at. Oh, I feel him. Right here. Who's plugging this hole? I got up? it. Right. No, put something in there. Put knees, feet, or something in that hole. <laughs> I got before this I hole into this big flat rock. Climb up there and put something in that hole right there. Put the arm. You let her string. Now move your hand around. I want something solid in that hole. You got that hole plugged up? The best I can get it in here. There ain't no holes underneath me that I can find. Huh? Ain't no holes underneath me that I can find. Now right here, he's coming this way. Right here. Right there. Make sure you got that plugged up. He's pointed your way. Because I just took, he's got a tail that tall. I ain't never felt his head. Ooh. Turn I'm trying around. to feel around, see if I got all this plugged off good enough. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to have to turn him around when I go in there where he's at. Think he'll come to meet you? No. <laughs> <Blue> cat, <laughs> buddy. He's a big flathead. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm gonna go in here and feel it. Okay. Oh, he's here's his big old tail right here. You want to feel his tail? Yeah. Stick your arm right in this hole right here under this rock. Feel my. You got your gloves yeah. on? Cause he may turn around and whack you. Hope not. <laughs> right under this rock right here. Just feel this hole right there. Run your arm back in. Got that hole plugged. Yeah, I feel him. He's got a big tail. He's got a big tail down there. <laughs> right. Yeah, he's big. Okay, I'm gonna try to go in there and turn him. I've got him. Right Let's here. go. Drag him out. Get back in the hole now. He's huh? tangling me up over here. There, right, I'm around. Put the bad boy up. <laughs> Easy there, Cletus. You want to hold him? He's a lot yeah. heavier. He's about 35, 30 to 35. Yeah, yeah he's, he's heavy. See, under when he's out of the water, he's out of his element, but underneath the water, he's he's designed to have a lot more power than you'd think that a fish that, you know, mm -hmm. if you were to wrestle up, say, a 30-pound little baby pig, it wouldn't be that rough, but a <laughs> fish like this in his own element in the water, he really has mm -hmm. some, some strength. So you say once they get caught, they're... Yeah, they become kind of docile. Once you catch them and put them on the stringer, he more or less knows that he's caught and he gives up. Well, we hope today's stories remind you that Oklahoma is a perfect place to explore. So no matter how you choose to enjoy our state's incredible natural world, remember, your adventure starts with Outdoor Oklahoma. All right, guys, well, where are you all off to next? Outdoor Oklahoma is produced by the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation and is proud to serve and be funded entirely by sportsmen and women and outdoor enthusiasts who love and appreciate all things wild in the great state of Oklahoma.